Thank you for joining us at Community On Demand. Today's message is presented by Dr. Rich Pastron. Rich has written two books that are available on Amazon, The Story of the Bible and The Jesus People Movement. Rich holds a bachelor's degree in management, a master of divinity, and a PhD. Rich is also an adjunct professor at Grace School of Theology and teaches the adult Bible class on Sunday mornings at Community Church. This message was recorded during a live Sunday morning service. Let's join Rich as he begins his message. And I want to encourage you guys this morning with uh, something really, really simple. And, uh, and that is, I'm gonna, we're going to look at three prayer requests. And I hope these prayer requests will uh, change your ministry. Your ministry, that's right. Now, that's very anecdotal. It's very simple, simple. Uh, I'm an academic and I hate simplicity. I love complexity. I love dirtying the waters and just leaving it there for people to kind of figure their way out. So it's just my nature. Um, so, um, I'm going to make this, I'm going to go the other way with this. This is kind of against my grain, but still we'll, 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 uh, we'll look at, at, at three prayer requests and I'll tell you where that's going to be found in just a minute. But, uh, I, I like this because this is, this is going to be a prayer from the apostle Paul. And many times in prayer, whether it's a prayer team that we have here, or maybe when you get together, our prayer requests focus on stuff things, getting things done. Uh, somebody needs a job. So we pray that they can get a job. I think that's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that. So it's just not saying that's bad stuff. It's just, it's just a piece of prayer and prayer can involve worship and confession and praise and thanksgiving and asking, give me, give me stuff. And a lot of stuff that prayer can, can contain. Um, But there's something here in these prayers for Paul that I, I just, that he is making, he's requesting that I want you to grasp. And I'm going to look at the end of Ephesians, the end of Colossians. I've got my scripture up here. You can turn to your Bible if you want, but I'm going to have it up here for you. And I would say, here's, here's a quick suggestion for you off topic from today. And that is go through the books of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Galatians, and make a note of Paul's prayer for people. And you're going to find... He's not just asking for stuff like somebody lost a job. I'm praying that you get a job. Again, I'm not being critical or cynical of that. I think it's beautiful. We need to pray that way. But what happens to the person when they're unemployed? If you've ever been unemployed, it's, it's, uh, it's, you, you feel very low. You feel very down. And, uh, and so there's a need for growth there. So there's a time for growth. Maybe we should be praying in that season for God's growth in their life. Look at Paul's prayers. I'm not going to start to summarize them, but there are many that he's praying for people and they're spiritual in nature. It's really beautiful. So that's your own assignment. We're not teaching on that today, but he's going to ask for prayer. And I like this because Paul is asking for prayer and he's going to say, pray for me and pray for us in Colossians, pray for his team. And I like this because I've been a missionary for, I don't know, 32, 35, 36, 38 years, something like that. I'm losing track. And one thing that early on, I started working on to recruit and early on in Arthur and I's life, we began to bring this piece of our missionary life together. And that was prayer and getting a prayer team to pray for us. So when Paul says pray for us, it's easy to overlook those words. I read that and think, wow, here we go. Here's a prayer request I can send to our prayer support team. Now we have a prayer support team that stretches back. Oh dear. 1980. I have one that's back to 1986. I would say 1986. That's quite a few years ago, back when dinosaurs were walking the earth for those of you that are younger. Um, some of them have died and gone to be with the Lord. I think I've shared some of those. There was, there was a group of old, this is by the way, this is not on my notes. So here we go. Uh, there was a group of older ladies when I was a new believer and the pastor said, go visit these old ladies and make sure they're okay. And they were wonderful. They're very godly ladies. And so it was kind of fun. You know, one of the ladies was 96 years old. I think I told you guys this before and her name was May. And, uh, you know, she used to bring out ice cream to me. And when I'd visit and say, the doctor says I shouldn't have this because I have diabetes. I'm thinking to myself, well, May, you're 96, eat all the ice cream you want. You're not going to make it to 97 or something. I mean, you know, come on. Anyway, they prayed for me. And then when I met Arthi and I brought her down to meet my family, um, they wanted to meet her. And so kind of, you know, scope out, make sure I was on track. And uh, they said, oh, wow. Yeah, she's great. And then they started praying for her. <laughs> Poor girl. 
So even to this, even to this day, I just, I just think to myself, you know, what, what was in her mind the day I asked her to marry me? I don't know. She was not drinking, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, wow, I've been so blessed with her. But they prayed. They prayed for a wife for me when I was a single missionary. And, and then, you know, together they prayed for family, people over the years, and we communicate personally. I was joking with a missions pastor out of Fort Lauderdale a number of years ago. We were saying how you know, prayer support becomes sort of the subtle innuendo of financial support. <laughs> so we never, we never went that route. We always said, this is our prayer support team, and we are not going to innuendo to them that we need money. So we would joke about the subliminal messaging in prayer, prayer letters and things that would say, you know, dear prayer <coughs> money support team, we are just praying money this year that, uh, that God raises up more more prayer money supporters so that we can get God's work done. Because without prayer money, the work isn't. So we would joke around this missions pastor and I, and you know, it was, it was just kind of like, you know, don't, don't innuendo in your prayer, make it a prayer letter. And we got away from these big prayer letters with all the nice margins and pictures and long lengthy notes. Why? Well, because we're people just like everybody else is. And I can always imagine receiving this long lengthy email with pictures and stuff and just, oh dear Lord, I don't have the time. And you start reading the letter and it's got pray for X, can't use his name. So we're praying for X and we're praying for D, and we're praying for people and things. It's just too much. So we would, we would get into just a, you know, short line things. And we knew people for years. So we would say, Hey, we're praying for your, for your, uh, for your husband's cancer treatment. And, uh, by the way, here's something you can pray for us on. Our kids are, are uh, you know, facing this at the local school, and can you pray for them? And so it was very personal. Arthi maintained that for a long time. All that to say, a little background. This is, is very personal uh, to me when I read Paul's prayers, and he's asking for people to pray. So uh, you could make these prayers yours for your own life and ministry. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buzz through these pretty quickly. So I'm going to focus in on the narrowness of the gospel. That's the context that he's talking about. But you might want to broaden these out. So I'm not going to tell you how the Holy Spirit wants to apply these to your life. But I'm going to talk a little more narrowly about the gospel and Paul's prayers here. So we'll talk some about that. But maybe you need to think broader on these prayers and how these could affect your broader life, ministry, etc. So here we go. I'm reading from... And by the way, I need to check because this has been set up differently. We're good. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, uh, where Paul says these words, pray also for me. Think about that. Think of, keep that in mind as we read through these next things. Paul needs prayer for these three items. Think about this. This is great. Paul's a human being, right? So here we go. That whenever I speak, words may be given to me. So that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So we see number one prayer, clear communication. Okay, I'm not going to get into the Greek language and everything. That's another day. Just surfacey stuff, grabbing this off. That's really what he's talking about here. Pray that whenever I speak, words may be given to me. Good words. Another prayer down here is the word fearlessness. So you might drop in there boldness or courage, right? So there's already our second prayer, Ephesians 6. Clear communication, boldness. And again, he has this word fearlessly. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly the way that I should, right? Not timidly. Okay, so we go over, let's put those up on the top there. Let's go to Colossians 4 verses, I think it's 3 and 4. It's a little blurry without my glasses. Uh, Pray for us too. This time he's including the team that he's with. Let's pray for our team. That God may open a door for our message. So that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. And pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. So here's an open door or an opportunity. I find this to be fascinating. Uh, Language is... Mm. metaphors. Mm. Oh dear. You know, I think I've shared with you the one in Hindi with uh, you're eating my brains, Hindi language, you're eating my brains. You know, get used to using metaphors in other languages. It doesn't have any connection whatsoever with anything we would say here, except it just sort of means you're bothering me. It's like you're trying to do your studies and you're working and somebody keeps coming in and bothering you and bothering you and bothering you. You tell them you're eating my brains. Stop it. 
So it's just, you know, it's, it sounds kind of weird, but that's how our English language idioms sound in other languages. Greek idioms sometimes sound strange in English and they have to be, the meaning has to be translated out. But this one's just right on the surface. An open door is an idiom. It's, it's a metaphor. It's a, it's a figure of speech. It means an opportunity, right? And it's, it's used back 2000 years ago, Paul was using it. I find that kind of cool. Just right on the surface. There's the idiom, open doors, opportunities. And then he says, pray, pray that I may proclaim it clearly. So here we have this clear communication. So I put number one, number three up there on opportunity and open door. There's your third request. I put number one on clear communication. Why? Because we already had that one in Ephesians chapter six. So he's asking for two requests in Ephesians, two in Colossians, but one of them is repeated. So if we put those together, we have prayer for clear communication, courage, and open doors. Pretty simple. So think about it. I want to elaborate a little bit on this, but think about it for your own life. Uh, I'm going to switch them around because it makes a better preaching way. So I'm going to start with opportunities and open doors. Uh, we'll, do, we'll do courage second and then clear communication. Um, and I just, before we roll on, I want to just make a note of this. And you're going to see this in some scripture that I bring up. That he's looking for God's hand. So you might think of opportunities and, and actually there's a lot of opportunity all the time. Sometimes too much opportunity that we have to say no to things. And I like even in second Corinthians chapter two, Paul says, God opened a great door in Troas, but he didn't take it. Yeah, go read that one. That one really helped me a couple of times in turning down opportunities, big opportunities because of personal needs. He wanted to find Titus. And he said, I was just itching inside to learn what was up with Titus. And so I went off to Macedonia and I left. I didn't take this opportunity. God opened. So there's, there's a lot that we could talk about. We're not going to talk about, but just, just capture this here. Just God's hand praying for means he's looking for God's hand in something, especially in the area of boldness and uh, courage. We're going to get to this in a minute, but you know, some people are just sort of crass. Uh, they are, as we would say, a bull in a China closet, or maybe a cow in a China closet. If it's a woman, uh, instead of a man, I don't know how those, exp those, those, <laughs> those, those idioms and metaphors work. Anyway, I'll get in trouble real soon here. Careful. Bull in a China closet. It is so, so you know, we're going to see this in a moment. That courage and boldness, is, this isn't just human factors. So some of us do have sort of a little less fear about saying things and speaking and speaking our mind. Um, I'm glad that Paul needed prayer for this. He was looking for God's hand. We're going to pull this apart in a moment. He's looking for God's hand in being able to speak clearly. He's looking for God's hand in open doors and opportunities. So praying for these, pray for these, add these three to your prayer list. When you pray for yourself, God, give me an open door. Give me courage and give me clear communication. Very simple idea. God opens the door. When the moment comes, you've got the courage to step through it and you've got the right sort of words and, and it happens, right? Okay. So open doors, I want to just elaborate on this with some other Bible verses. We read about it in Colossians chapter four, verse one. Uh, and, and, and behind this idea of an open door, there are a few assumptions. And I need my glasses to read my notes here. Sorry. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's a sense to where you desire this. So Paul's praying for an opportunity to share the faith. It means that he wants it. It means that he's on the hunt for it. He's ready at any moment. He's like the car thief who's an opportunist who walks through the parking lot, just checking doors to see if anybody left, left their car unlocked. That's why we have people watching the parking lot. Uh, and so, you know, he's like that sort of a person um, in Britain. This might surprise you, but petty thievery is, is, very, very common. You never, 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 never leave a sweater on a front seat or back seat. Never. Because somebody will come by, most likely within about five minutes of you leaving your car somewhere and break a window, assuming there might be money or a phone or something in the, in the, in the pocket. You'll come out and your window's broken and your sweater's gone. Your jumper, as we call it in England. So, uh, you know, petty thievery, opportunist. He's just on the hunt all the time looking for that sort of a, a break. So this is, we're not petty thieves, but, but, you know, we are, we are Christians and we're praying. Paul was saying, I'm looking for the opportunity for God to give it. It's in his heart. He wants it. He wants the chance. Give me the chance, God, open the opportunity. God help me to show, show me the way here and open something for me. 
right? Okay. Now, so to accomplish what you want to do now for Paul, this is the gospel. You know, you, you can broaden this up a bit for your life. You know, if you're into business and earning money, so you can give money to God's work. If you've got your kids and grandkids and you're praying for access into their lives, you know, take this where you want to go. The context, Paul wanted to share the faith. He had a burning passion to share the faith. And so, you know, there's an assumption there, right? There's an assumption that uh, you know, there's kind of a window of time when you get an opportunity, isn't it? You don't want to miss it. Don't miss that opportunity. It, it might pass you by. And then, uh, you know, you're asking God for this right moment and circumstances. So you're, you're praying to God for that. Lord, I'm looking for it. I'm watching for it. I want something. I need this. Wow, what a, what a great thing even to do in ministry. Really, uh, really good thing to be doing in ministry. Praying even for our local church this way. Add that one to your prayer requests as you pray for church here. Opportunity, Lord. Opportunity. Now, in Greek, Paul is asking for asking, not asking for opportunities, but an opportunity. And so we're going to look at a few of Paul's, but I also want to see where Jesus himself encourages this kind of prayer. He says in Matthew 7, 7 and 8, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find knock and the door will be opened. Ah, oh, there's the open door for whoever ask, receive, whoever seeks, finds, whoever knocks, the door will be open to them. Sorry, I'm going to have to turn up here and look, read it with you. Uh, Acts 14, 27. This is Paul and Barnabas after their first missionary journey. Notice what they did. They came back and gathered all the, all the Christians at the church of Antioch, the church that had sent them out. They came back there. They gathered them all and made a report of what God had done. They called the church together, reported everything God had done through them and how... He had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. God opened that door. So when you read Acts 13 and 14, all those amazing things that were taking place in those two chapters on Paul's first journey with Barnabas, Paul said, look what God opened up for us. God opened that door for us, right? Okay, 1 Corinthians 16, 8 and 9. I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened for me. So God opening a door, one more verse, two more. When I was in Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me. And that's the verse I was sharing with you. He ended up turning it down and going on. But you notice Paul is seeing God opening a door for him and he takes it. He takes it. So this isn't just, there's lots of opportunities to serve or that sort of a generic broad thing. This is quite precise, praying for, looking for those opportunities. Now I find this last one here to be very uh, interesting. And that is Revelation 3, 7 and 8. The Lord says, I know all the things you do and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. Think about that. Because it's not just you in your own humanist sort of a way, creating opportunities to do things, God opening a door, a door. He's giving you, let's say if this was the you, you were the you there. He's giving you an opportunity. He's going to open that door and no one's going to close it. Just imagine that that's God speaking that to you personally. What does that tell you about that open door? about that opportunity. It's going to happen. It means that no matter others trying to do things to close it down, it ain't going to close down. It's not going to happen. It's going to stay open because the Lord has opened it and the Lord is holding it open. So you can take advantage of this moment in this time. I find that to be a very encouraging verse. Okay, there you go. So opportunities, you know, let me just give you one quick thing here. I want to move on to this next, this next thing about courage, but, um, God opens up so many opportunities for us. And sometimes as we pray and we look, sometimes things seem a little out of place. You know, it might be the order of things. It might be the timing of things. It might be, uh, it might be just the way that it all comes together, but, but you're looking for and praying for this opportunity. You're watching for it. Uh, I went to Cambodia. I forget exactly when with Jim K. He's a friend of mine. He was a YWAM missionary for 
10 or 15 years in Hong Kong and a mission pastor out of Fort Lauderdale. So we went together and we were doing some sort of exploring things there of church planning that was going on. And there was a group that went there to start an orphanage. And uh, they got their building, got their permissions, and they had their orphanage and they were all ready to go. But no orphans. <laughs> kind of backward. Usually you go and you, you're there ministering and you find kids in need and you know, they need education, they need help and taken care of and they need the Lord and the gospel and all that. And you get there and you, know, you kind of get things going that way. So they had their building, they had a facility, everything. There was a team of them and no orphans. And so they were praying and they said, Lord, well, what do we do? You know, we, we don't have any orphans. We got an orphanage. So uh, one of the guys was walking out on the road one day. This, this really, really happened. Listen to this. I'm like God opening a door for them. Walking down the street, about three streets away from the orphanage. And here comes a group of about, I think it's about eight or 10 young boys, 13 to 15 years of age, walking down the road. And so as you do in many countries around the world, it's, it's not impolite or improper to stop and talk to people. So he stopped and said, hey, group of young guys, what you guys doing? You're not playing football or, you know, cricket or something today. So, uh, no, 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 we're, uh, we were in an orphanage and the orphanage just sh shut down. This was the last day and they've just chased us out. We have absolutely nowhere to go. So uh, here they are walking down the road. So he says, wow, okay. We have an orphanage and no orphans. Would you like to be our orphans? <laughs> so here they came. Here comes this guy back to the facility. He says, we got our orphans for starting. So uh, anyway, when we got there, th some of those guys that were 15 to 20, to 15 to 16 years old were now about 25, 26 years old. And the orphanage had grown. And listen to this. When we got there, they said, before going, they said, if you want to come visit the orphanage, you need to come during the week because that's when we're doing all of our stuff there, school, education, and Bible studies, and there's worship in the evening. So we said, well, what happens on the weekend? So we were told that these guys that are now 25, 26 years old, they go out on the weekends and they start churches. And even the kids go along. And they, the kids run kids' ministries. You know, 10-year-old kids running kids' ministries, and, and they're out planting churches out in the village areas. So it's quite, quite phenomenal. So thinking, that, that's kind of interesting, you know. So that's, that's kind of backward on the story. We said, how did you get started in this? And that's where they started telling us their story. It was all sort of backward. We had a facility and nowhere to go. So anyway, uh, I just find that to be interesting. Open doors, they can come all kinds of ways. Uh, I could get lost here just talking about opportunities. I think you could too. Thinking about that. But never stop praying. You know, if you're younger, it might just be the opportunity of, of your whole life in front of you and the ability to trust God, to not be afraid that he'll take care of you, to hear his call saying, hey, come on, trust me, put your life in my hands. I'm going to take care of you. So, uh, you know, the Lord can do great and wonderful things. It might, it might just be, you know, a very couple of year opportunity. It might be something more like Grace School of Theology, where we see an opportunity that's opened up and it's been now years as it continues to progress and grow. So... Uh, you know, a lot of ways to think about that. Okay, boldness and courage. So I would say that some of the assumptions that underline this is that we are naturally afraid of uh, what people will think, what people will say. I think it's a very natural fear. Is it, I don't know if it's just me. Uh, I've kind of gotten over it a lot, but sometimes where my fear comes in is I just want to make sense to people. I can be a little bizarre, a little funky, and I like to like kind of be straight line and normal and hold still. And, and so, uh, you know, I try that. And then sometime in my desire to appear normal, uh, I kind of, I start up ending up feeling kind of bound. Uh, the, uh, there are these inhibitions in, in, about the way we speak. Maybe, maybe you're tongue-tied. Maybe you have a stutter. Maybe uh, you've tried many times to talk to people and the words just don't come out right. Uh, so, um, yeah, these tend to make us kind of quiet or timid. So, uh, in the Greek New Testament, the, the idea, I would guess, the, uh, this is my thought, is that the idea behind the word in Greek for courage and fearlessness and boldness is actually the word freedom. It's the sense of being loosed and being free and confident to speak. So in other words, uh, it's kind of like that thing of somebody sitting down with you and say, you know, tell me what you really believe. What do you really believe? Come on, let it out. No holding back, right? Uh, just say what's in your heart. So it's, it's, it's less of the idea of kind of working something up. It's more of the idea 
of releasing and letting it out. It's, it's a gift that the spirit gives to just let it go. Just to, to your inhibitions kind of, he brings them down and you're able to speak. So uh, it's that sort of freedom. And I'm going to say these verses we're going to look at have to do with the gospel. So it's speaking freedom, free to speak. Uh, also free to live, just to live out what God wants you to do without holding back, right? Live out what's in your heart. So just that liberation and freedom to live out what you want to live out. Uh, I believe with all my heart that if you're working somewhere in a job and you decide you're going to start preaching on Monday afternoon in the office and just live out your faith, you decide to go to your closet somewhere where jackets and stuff are stored. You're going to pray in there instead of going to your desk and working. My guess is, is by about five o'clock, you'll be looking for another job. So, uh, you know, all of this has its context, right? Paul was a missionary and preacher, uh, but he's praying for boldness. And I often wonder with this, was Paul a little bit tired of the beatings? You ever tasted your own blood in your own mouth from being punched? Have a tooth loose from being punched? for preaching. You ever have that happen repeatedly? So many times that, you know, maybe his head was a little deformed and reshaped. Maybe he had a few limps. Read the list of suffering that he went through. And maybe in his mind, he's thinking, you know, I really want to share the gospel, but God, I'm just, can it be a little easier one time, please? A little bit easier. So I don't know what's driving him with this prayer, uh, but, but maybe this is part of it. So he's asking for courage. He's asking for, for fearlessness. So I'm just going to read a couple of uh, verses here. And I want you to notice, this is the book of Acts. I want you to notice the filling of the Holy Spirit associated with this courage, right? So it says, then Peter in Acts 4, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter was already filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2. That's what, that's what it actually says. And they were all filled with the Spirit. So the Spirit now lives within him. He's not leaving him and coming back to him and leaving and coming back to him. But it's just this sense that D.L. Moody used to say that, you know, he leaks he leaks. The old preacher from the early 1900s, he said he prays for the filling of the spirit because he always is leaking. So Peter filled with the spirit said to them, and then he begins to preach a very bold message to them. Right? Uh, so the response of this religious group that he's preaching to says, when they saw the courage, there's our word fearlessness of Peter and John, they realized they run schooled ordinary men. Isn't that nice? You don't have to be really educated to be courageous. They were astonished and they took note and these, that these men had been with Jesus. Uh, so let's see. Did I miss something here? Yeah, so verses 18 to 20, continuing on in that story, what happened is that they, the Sanhedrin gathered uh, Peter and John and told them to stop preaching. And so uh, they sent them out for a moment, decided how they would discipline Peter and John. So while Peter and John were out, they had this discussion. They brought them back in and they warned uh, Peter and John. It says they called them in and again, and they commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. And then it says from there, continuing on the story, they went out right away after being told, don't preach anymore. And they met with the church and they have this nice, wonderful prayer. And it says it again, that they were filled with the spirit as they were praying. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the spirit and they went out and spoke the word of God boldly. So you see here, this is not something you're working up. It's something that the spirit brings on and sort of lowers the inhibitions. So as, for example, in the book of uh, Ephesians chapter five, verse 18, it's, it says there, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. You've heard that verse before. I'm sure you've heard some teaching on that. Uh, it's not that being filled with the spirit is like getting drunk. It's not that, but there's, a, there's, a, there's a parallel. I think that Paul is drawing in that alcohol will lower your inhibitions. Some of you know that a little bit too well. Uh, you know, somebody who's had a little bit too much to drink, it, maybe they're a little bit of an aggressive individual, you know, and they're ready to fight. They're ready to fight. I'll fight all 10 of you. I'll take you on one at a time, rolling up their sleeves. They're the toughest person in the world. Yeah, the person who usually is a little bit quiet suddenly comes out and they're talking. Where is so-and-so? And they're ready to just kind of give them a piece of their mind. Um, you know, there's a, uh, boy, I could get started with stories there. 
So anyway, you know, I think you know what I'm talking about. There's, there's that sense there that's wrong. And Paul says that that kind of a life, drinking leads to, leads to a spiraling down, a spiraling down. It's an addictive lifestyle. Alcohol will lead you to prison, to a mental institution, or death. So Paul's not encouraging that life. He's just saying there's something there. Like the Holy Spirit, when he fills you, suddenly your heart is able to praise. You're feeling bold and courageous to speak. You feel liberated. The inhibitions are down and off you go and you you begin to speak. So um, just one other verse here. Acts 9, 28, talking about Paul. At this point, he's still using his Saul name. Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. And of course, there's that verse in Joshua, which is so loved, isn't it? This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So courage, uh, boldness, and uh, just as a, a, a kind of a, an example, I think, that captures it here. Maybe, maybe this won't, maybe it will, but um, I do find a great difference here in being a crass, harsh person who just has no inhibitions. Are you with me? I think for many of us as Christians, it's normal. I think it's partly helpful to have some inhibitions. It is. Otherwise we're just, we're just too loosey goosey on, on the way we live and the way we speak. So, uh, so it's normal, but somehow getting help to overcome this. Uh, when we were in England, uh, worked with an Iranian pastor named Reza Knew him the whole time we were there. He and his wife, wonderful, wonderful people. We were very good friends, still are to this day. But I worked for about a year and a half just with him. And he was running Bible studies in the city of Birmingham. And a lot of refugees were coming there. And um, so it was common to have sort of 50, 60 Iranians at a Bible study. I don't speak Farsi. I know some basic greetings. I would bring my keyboard along and try to play some Iranian songs, which I quickly learned I don't know how to do. Um, Sometimes Razor would have me teach. One time at a Bible study, as I was sitting and listening, I would ask Reza afterward questions, right? So one time at the Bible study, there's a guy in the front row down here. And Reza's teaching. And this guy's down here. (laughs) And Reza wasn't stopping it. I said, what in the world's going on? So Reza talked with him afterward, and then I was asking questions. What's with, what's with the laughing guy? He said, this guy, he says, he's from Iran, right? You have to remember, he's from Iran. He's listening to me speak, Reza said. And he said, if you speak that way in Iran, they will kill you. And he's just so, he's so impressed with the liberty and the freedom to be able to speak. And Reza wasn't like shouting and working up, just teaching, just teaching. But he was, he was chuckling because in my country, they kill you. And you have such freedom here, you can just speak, whoa. So you follow what I'm saying there. That, that freedom, that liberty, I find is a very gracious and wonderful thing, not a crass kind of uh, harshness. But anyway, we move on from boldness to clear communication and, uh, Again, the assumption here or assumptions might be that it's possible to get it wrong or to get it right. So God opens an opportunity. You've got the courage filled with the spirit. Here we go. Going to speak freely. And out comes a bunch of what? Kind of tongue-tied, garbled speech. Now, if you're going to be honest, I'm telling you, I got to be honest. There are times that that's happened. God's given a really good opportunity and the words just were not coming out right. And I can remember kicking myself thinking, "Ah, Lord, you gave me the chance there. And I was trying, I was so tongue tied. Okay, Lord, I'm just going to trust you with whatever was said. Um, I have been amazed at times when I have preached some of the worst sermons I ever thought I preached. And people come up afterward and say, wow, that was great. (laughs) You crazy. (laughs) <laughs> it's horrible, in my opinion. I don't tell them that, but I'm thinking that in my head, right? This person's out of their mind. Great sermon. That was horrible. I didn't say anything right. I was tongue-tied and no humor and no, you know, whatever. It just, it was, it was boring. Oh, no, they loved it. They were drinking it in. So, you know, you just never know. You never know. But we do want to make sure we try to get our speech right, right? You say things kind of right or wrong. And I think it's also very possible um, to be misunderstood, So what I'm not saying is this. What I'm not saying is that. What I'm not saying is this. We say those kinds of things to clarify. So I like this. Paul is praying that God would give him the right words. Isn't that kind of cool? Uh, Let me give you a couple Bible verses, and I'll share a couple things that might be helpful with that. This is Acts chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. This is Stephen. 
And it says one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to debate with Stephen. They were Jews from Cyrene, that's Libya, Alexandria, that's Egypt, Cilicia, that's up by Paul's region of uh, Turkey, and from the province of Asia. That particular part of Asia is the western part where Ephesus is. You can see they're from a large area and they've got a synagogue there in uh, Jerusalem. So none of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. Isn't that amazing? So God giving Stephen wisdom with these people as they're trying to counter his, uh, his claims about Jesus being the Messiah, but they couldn't stand against him. Now, I don't hear here the courage and the boldness. I just hear here the spirit giving wisdom and right words, right? Okay. Acts 2.37, Peter's long sermon, when he's finished with it, listen to the words of the people. Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Whoa. Now that right there, that phrase is one that I listen for as I'm sharing the gospel with somebody. It really, really, really is. If I'm walking through things with them, asking them questions, dialoguing with them, and they get to a place where you've showed, you've told them about the gift of life, eternal life, that if they believe the gospel, they will, they will today experience a huge change. And the spirit of God will make them his temple and live inside of them. And they will be God's child and forever. They will live with the Lord in heaven. No more fear of death. No more fear of family. No more fear of nothing else. Just God's going to save you and something, you know, blah, 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 whatever. And they sit there and say, well, what do I do? Oh, this is great. What do you do? Very good. You pray. Simple prayer. You just ask the Lord to come inside of you and live. It's going to sound something like this. Lord Jesus, make me clean. Forgive me of my sins. You're the savior. Something simple like that coming from your heart. Do you want to pray something like that? Yeah, you do. You know, what's going to happen. We're going to pray. And right now something's going to happen. And when we're finished praying, you're, all this stuff is going to happen. You're going to be, you're going to be God's child and blah, 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 blah. And so on you go. So I, I like that phrase. Peter said something right. They were cut to the quick. Uh, and then there's this fellow, Apollos. He refuted the Jews with powerful arguments in public debate using the scriptures. And he explained to them that Jesus was uh, the Messiah. So, hey, just in sort of wrapping this up, a few things on clear, clear communication. I can't help but jump on this one for a moment. Um, I'm an American. In case you didn't notice, lived in America. Uh, I don't like the conversation in our country these days. I'm going somewhere with this conversation, so bear with me for just a moment. I don't like the conversation of wokeism. I don't like the conversation of white people bad, brown people good, and all that stuff. If that makes you cringe when I say that, I'm so sorry. But I've been a missionary and I've lived abroad for years. I don't like all that sort of conversation about race because I find it very provocative and ugly and dirty. But I've lived with an Asian woman, an Indian woman. I've been introduced into India through the back door of family, you might say. Not as a missionary, not as an expat. Uh, for years, all we ever talked about was culture, sometimes skin tones. And nobody's talking racism. We're just, just talking. Culture is very different. Language is very different. So please understand, that's kind of where I come from. Uh, although I'm an American, I, I have been changed significantly from living abroad in, in so many ways I can't begin to describe. But it's kind of nice to be back in my own country. Because a lot of stuff that I say here, I can assume same American language, same culture. Uh, you know, although, although I'm more from a different area of the country than Texas, uh, I'm still learning Texas as we were saying the other day about, about there's a restaurant here where they, I, when I first heard of this restaurant, I thought they boiled their hamburgers. Yeah. Came here to Houston. Somebody said, let's go to Waterburger. 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 You know, Waterburger. Let's go see this place. You know, orange. Looks like orange colors and well, orange. You go inside looking for vats where they boil. Why do you call it Waterburger? It's what a burger. Oh, no, it's just the way it's said, right? Okay. So anyway, uh, that's, you know, language and what. So we're still a bit different regionally in, in America. But, you know, the, uh, 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 speaking a different language is, is fun. It's frustrating. It's something you'll never get out of kind of your Greek and Hebrew studies and Chaldean studies, because they're all dead languages. When you're speaking a language, you've got so much that's involved. I mean, there's little, little, little things in a conversation. Like, how do you show somebody when you're talking to them that you're following them? 
So they're talking, talking, talking. Uh-huh. And this is kind of how we do here, isn't it? We kind of nod your head to show you that I'm with you. I'm with you. You know, if I'm talking to you and you're just sort of like this. I mean, okay, it's time to go. This person's not interested in talking to me. So, you know, for my wife's culture, especially when you're first kind of talking, there's a lot of repetition, a lot of repetition, right? So you meet up, hey, how you doing? You know, come to the come to the long shot, hot shot, pa, kriya, pa, kriya, ni, kriya, ho, kriya. You know, kriya, she kit. So kriya, 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 kriya. Everybody's saying, what's kriya? What's cold? It's cold out these days, right? So it's just kind of the way that everybody's kind of chiming in with it. It's kriya, it's kriya, it's kriya, you know. Uh, Chad, when I was in Chad, the Chadians, they have this clicking sound. So, uh, you know, if you're talking to somebody and uh, they might occasionally click just to show you they're still there, they're listening. But if they're really getting into what you're saying, it kind of speeds up a second, slows back down, you know, can you do that? I'm not going to embarrass you. <laughs> See, it's, it, we don't do that. So imagine if I'm sitting here back here and I'm, you know, Frank, I'm talking to you and I'm sitting back here going, you know, what's wrong with him, man? You know, he's gonna, the French, the French people are really interesting because they, they have this gasping that they do. You ever talk to French people in French, you know? And so if you're having a conversation, they're really following the, huh? huh? do you know that? Did you know that? Yeah, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. The first time you hear it, you're talking to somebody and they, huh? and you, you kind of stop. What, what happened? What happened? Oh, I'm just, I'm just following the conversation. Oh, okay, sorry, carry on, you know. But there, there are a lot of then subtleties that take place. I'm talking about miscommunications, right? So in our culture, we are very much uh, kind of cathartic. And I come from a very good family. I really do. My mom and dad are great, wonderful Christians. My mom passed away recently. Um, just great example in so many respects. Some people don't. And so you'll hear people in our country where we, and again, I'm not saying this, that we're bad. This is difference of culture. F- please follow me and misunderstanding when you go cross cultural. Um, and you'll hear people say like, well, I was born into an alcoholic home. My dad was an alcoholic and he used to get drunk and beat me and beat my mom. And, and when we hear those kind of things, our heart right away has empathy, right? Oh, poor person, right? And oh, this, this story is relating to the crowd because some out there have that same experience. Now, if you are anywhere in Asia, anywhere in England, and you're talking to Asian people or African people, and you get up and say that your dad's an alcoholic, you know what people will think of you? Shame on you. Talking about your father like that. You respect your father. Your dad may have problems, but you don't bring it in here and tell everybody. Now, right away, our tendency is to judge that. Oh, see, we're better because we're more open. No, your judgments soon dissipate when you realize that it doesn't matter how much you think that's right or wrong. If you want them to understand you, you don't talk about your father and mother and sort of think that people will understand that's, that's just being cathartic. They will think, shame on you. You're a bad person shaming your father. He's not even here to defend himself. I kind of wish he was and he'd give you a beating. Even if you're 50 years old, you need one. So you know, it's, it's just kind of fascinating is all I'm saying. You know, English language in Britain, you depersonalize your language a lot. So if you're sending an email uh, here, you might say something like, hey, thanks for your email. Uh, could you clarify a couple of things in this email? In, in England, that's, that's really aggressive language. You know, you just say, hey, you know, uh, we received the email. We, because, you know, I and you, we don't want to get that, that connected and that sort of punchy with somebody. So we received the email, just needed a few clarifications. Just needed. There's no you and me in there that kind of disengages the conversations. Anyway, these are very, very, you know, kind of tiny little things. Uh, I find it interesting that Paul probably spoke about three languages. By the way, we're, we're just about done here. I'll wrap this all up. Paul probably spoke three, maybe four languages. In Acts 14, he understands that the people there are saying that the gods have come down to us in human form. It's a Lycaonian language, probably what is called the Luca people. Now, those people were just over the Tarsus Mountains from where Paul was raised and lived his life in Cilicia and Tarsus. And there's a place there called the Cilician Gate that you go through there. It's a trade route, common trade route. So Paul might have been doing business as a tent maker with people that were coming and going from that region and probably familiar with them. So I'm just thinking, it's interesting, you know, he was very, very culturally diverse in his way and in his understanding of things. And, um, you know, all this to say, we live in a day where Houston is changing its makeup. 
It's diverse. It's there is no majority population is what that means. The diversity is great here. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for misunderstanding amongst, amongst us when, when everything is kind of same culture, but when cultures differ, there's even greater. And so there's that need in this area of communication for clear communication to be prayerful. Lord, I not only want the opportunity, I not only want you to give me just a, just a real freedom and a liberty to speak, but help me not to be afraid, but to be able to connect with somebody who's very different from me. So, you know, if, if for example, you're going to share the gospel with a Muslim person, you You don't begin with Jesus being the son of God. You might not ever get there in the first conversation, second, third, fourth conversations. Another way to start with a Hindu person. You may not, you may, you might want to begin with man being a temple. We are the temple of God and God's temple needs to be purified and clean. And only God can do that. You know, so, uh, you know, there's some, just some different sort of things you can learn. I took two different evangelism classes, many over the years, but two that were very helpful, uh, way of the master and, uh, uh, evangelism explosion. And I don't know if you've ever had an evangelism class. You might find it very canned formulaic. You have to memorize the way that you ask things and say things. Now I'll tell you, honestly, when I first got into an evangelism program, I was one of those people that's very kind of Holy spirit led, right? I still am, but I didn't like, I didn't like somebody telling me how you share the gospel, you know, (laughs) I just get in there and just let the Lord lead and say it. I realized as I was taking these classes that many times what I was telling people wasn't the gospel. It was just kind of whatever was in my head or a Bible verse I was reading that day, or they'd complain about the church. And I'd say, yeah, church is terrible. Well, I get home. I had a great chance to share the gospel. So I realized when I took classes on how to share the gospel, many times I really wasn't. So what is the gospel and how you share it? How do you transition a conversation with somebody to get into the gospel? And again, if religion is a bit different or background and culture, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you do that in a way that's going to be most helpful? Well, listen, I think enough said, I'm just going to close with prayer for these um, and ask that these would be prayers for you. Write this down. Remember this. These are Paul's prayer, prayer for his ministry team, prayer for himself. You can make them a part of your prayer. I don't know how your daily prayer runs, but maybe you should jot this into your prayer journal and start asking God for an opportunity. Ask him for opportunity. Ask him for an opportunity. Uh, Ask him for clear speech. Lord, when the time comes, help me and give me boldness, Lord. Give me courage. So uh, I'm just going to close this out in a word of prayer and praise team. Why don't you come up and I'm going to pray that God would lead in this area as we wrap this up. On behalf of Pastor Dan and the folks at Community, thank you for joining us today at Community On Demand. Feel free to share this link with others, and please know you are always welcome to be our guest during a live service any Sunday morning at our campus in the Woodlands, Texas. For more information, just click on the link, www.cbcwoodlands.org. I hope you will again join us at Community On Demand.